Be sure with Pure. The Pure Oil Company presents H.V. Kaltenborn. Regardless of what you buy, you, like everyone else, appreciate more for your money. An extra, a plus value, something over and above what you actually pay for. And believe me, you get it when you use Pure Oil's famous solvenized gasoline, Pure Pep and Woco Pep. The explanation is simple. Here it is in a nutshell. First, solvenized Pure Pep and solvenized Woco Pep are top quality gasolines. Then, to every gallon, we add Pure Oil's exclusive chemical combination that combats excess carbon in your motor. It actually cleans as it burns. While you're driving, this chemical extra is helping that solvenized gasoline to give your car more power, more pep, better all-round performance. For these extra benefits, you pay no more. Solvenized Pure Pep and solvenized Woco Pep sell at the price of regular. Doesn't it all add up to a good common sense buy? Try it. Drive in tonight or first thing tomorrow at the big blue and white Pure Oil sign. Remember, it costs no more to be sure with Pure. Now, here's H.V. Kaltenborn. Good evening, everybody. The important thing to remember in connection with the sinking of the German battleship Bismarck is that she was discovered, pursued, located, and crippled by aircraft. Chief credit for finding the Bismarck is given to an American-built PBY-5 flying boat. These planes have a cruising range of 5,000 miles, and like American bombers, need no convoys or patrols or shipping space to get them across the Atlantic. And today the President asked Congress for another three and a half billions to manufacture more bombers and more flying boats. To build a Bismarck takes over four years and costs something like $80 million. But the time will soon be here when a bomber can be completed in less than four months and the bomber costs only $100,000. On the same day on which we hear of the sinking of the Bismarck, Britain reveals that the Germans sank four cruisers and two destroyers with their bombing planes in the Battle of Crete. Here, too, superior air power was more important than superior sea power. Surface navies are still important, but sea power without air power has lost its historic might and mission. And in a crisis where speed is essential, bombers must precede battleships. Despite losses, the British Navy is still in action at Crete. It is reinforcing the British and preventing seaborne German forces from reaching Crete. But it does so at great risk. The Germans, with their control of the air, today report hits on several additional British warships. Fierce fighting continues in western Crete, where the Germans continue to have the upper hand. The British may have to give up the western half of the island and concentrate their remaining forces in the eastern half. Vichy today made a new pledge to the United States. A note delivered by the French ambassador pledges France will not surrender her fleet or her colonial empire to the Germans. But suppose the Germans take them as they took the Syrian air drones. Vichy is not a free agent, and we must remember that in appraising any promises Vichy may make. The dominant topic in Florida and Georgia, where I have just made a brief stay, is the power shortage everywhere. There are appeals to the public through poster, press, and radio to conserve power. An unprecedented drought, joined to an unprecedented defense demand, have created a critical situation. In many homes of the Southeast, the need to economize power will bring the first real sacrifice for defense. The private power companies of the Southeast are today eagerly looking towards the completion of new additions to that TVA power whose creation they once condemned as wasteful duplication. Today, every prominent power company of the Southeast is joining with the Tennessee Valley Authority in widespread advertisements, urging everyone to economize in the use of electric current. Air conditioning may have to go. Daylight saving may be extended. And the sale and use of power-consuming appliances may be curtailed. Some 40 Georgia mayors will meet in Atlanta tomorrow to launch a United Save Kilowatts program. Chairman McDonald of the Georgia Public Service Commission says... It has come down to a plain question of whether we will run our air-conditioned plants for comfort or build airplanes for our safety. In Pensacola yesterday, I visited the most complete naval air training station I have seen so far. The last time I saw Pensacola, 
It was a sleepy, charming little gulf town. Its municipal transportation system consisted of one car, one mule, and one Negro driver. When the system met me on the main street, the driver hailed me. This was early in 1899, and I was a soldier in uniform. Sergeant, he called. You all want a ride? Sure, I said. But you're going the wrong way. That's all right, boss, he answered. I'll turn around. He unhitched his mule, hitched it to the other end of the car, and off we went. I thought of that first Pensacola ride yesterday, as I enjoyed another in a huge Navy amphibian transport plane which carried me over two training stations, a Navy yard, two coast artillery forts, and some 30 airfields in a 15-minute flight around the shores of Pensacola Bay. Pensacola is an ideal base for naval aviation. It has the bay and the gulf for seaplanes, 30 strategically located landing and practice fields for land planes, and a deep water harbor big enough to hold the Atlantic fleet. Hundreds of aviation cadets are arriving each month, and at Pensacola, they really learn how to fly. I was particularly impressed with the ground school training, which the boys don't like, but which is just as essential as learning how to fly. They have learned one thing at Pensacola, that you can save many a young flyer from failure by teaching his teacher how to teach. Not every good flyer is a good teacher. By teaching teachers and eliminating men unfit for teaching, the Pensacola station has reduced eliminations by one half. While I was waiting yesterday to board a naval plane, an aviation cadet, landing on the field, jammed his brakes too hard and crashed. His plane nosed over on top of him. A siren sounded from the control power, and in 30 seconds, an ambulance, a control car, and a wrecking car were alongside the plane. Within a minute, the cadet was on his way to the hospital for a checkup. And within three minutes, the wrecked plane was tilted right side to and on its way to the hangar. And all the time, scores of other planes took off and landed in routine fashion. I also visited Fort Barangas and Fort Pickens and saw the Army teach selectees how to shoot a 12-inch gun. Practically everything in the way of armament at Fort Pickens is out of date, but the Army has wisely, dis wisely decided to put this fort way at the bottom of the priority list. We don't propose to wait until an enemy sails in the Pensacola Bay before tackling it. The men I saw training at Fort Pickens will soon man our new defense stations in the Caribbean, and someday they may be sent to islands even further out in the Atlantic. Ambassador Wynand is on his way home from London for important consultations. He reaches New York by Clipper on Friday. He will bring important information and may carry important decisions back to London. Clipper service across the Atlantic makes possible those complete private man-to-man -man exchanges which even the transatlantic telephone cannot provide. Tonight, the president will speak to 130 million Americans by radio. No previous president has ever been able to do that at a time when this nation faced the risk of war. Few American presidents could have used radio with the persuasive skill of Franklin D. Roosevelt. But tonight, something more than skill and persuasion is needed and expected. We are waiting to hear what the president will say. We know that he will say it well. This speech would make history, no matter how poorly it might be delivered. But it comes at a turning point of one of the world's great wars, and it will outline in more or less definite terms, the policy which this nation will follow towards that war. Many people believe we are already in this war. Others believe that we are committed to this war. Still others see definite and clearly defined limits to this commitment. There is still a considerable age short of war party which honestly believes that the president himself has it in his own hands to so limit and circumscribe our aid to Britain that we need not run the risk of war. Seven congressional isolationists, headed by Senator Wiener, today sent a letter to the president warning him against the use of convoys and any direct naval action which might mean war. The president's answer was to call the congressional leaders of both parties to the White House late this afternoon for a review of the talk to the nation which he will deliver tonight. The isolationists had warned the president in their letter today that 80% of the people of the United States, quote, are opposed to any course which will take this nation into the European war, end quote. They remind him that under the Constitution, only Congress can declare war. But the letter of the isolationists says nothing about the Lend-Lease Law, under which, by the vote of three-fourths of Congress, we are definitely committed to aid Britain. It warns the President, but suggests no alternative course of action under which he could carry out the duty which Congress has assigned to him of providing all-out effective aid to the British. A small group of isolationists in Congress have told the president what he should not do. This evening, 
the president gave the duly selected leaders of both parties in Congress the opportunity of telling him what they think he should do. In the course of human history, there are times when doing nothing may be more disastrous than doing something. There are times when a council of mere negation is not enough. The true leader is almost always the man of action. Speaker of the House Rayburn, after hearing the president read his speech, told him he approves it 100%. That's the first reaction to what the president will say to you tonight. Tonight's hour in history recalls other hours faced by other presidents when decision hung in the balance. American presidents are traditionally averse to war. No president has deliberately led this nation into war against the wishes of Congress and the people. But there are instances, beginning with the anxious days that preceded the War of 1812, when a war-minded America pushed a reluctant president into belligerence. That was true in 1812. And in the anxious weeks that preceded the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln prayed and hoped and struggled to avoid the steps that would bring war between the states. It was not the forces under his command that fired the first shots at Fort Sumter. For months, the peace-minded McKinley struggled against the Jingos who demanded war against Spain, only to yield at the very moment when he had Spain surrendered in his hand. Many of you remember the abuse heaped upon the head of Woodrow Wilson, the scholar president who talked of peace without victory and sought to avoid war for the United States in a last great effort to bring about a fair and enduring peace in Europe. So when you listen to the president tonight, don't forget that he has taken counsel with many of our best minds. The great majority of our people has shown again and again that it trusts him, particularly in his conduct of our foreign affairs. The majority of our people has approved the policy of giving practical effective help to Britain in the belief that this policy at least gave us a chance of avoiding total war. For in this at least, the isolationists are right. The American people do not willfully want war. The division that is among us arises because we differ as to the best ways of keeping every kind of war away from the Western world, which we have vowed to protect against aggression. And that means aggression by secret propagandists, saboteurs, fifth columnists, trade stealers and spies, as well as open military aggression. When your enemies are Nazis, you must define what is true peace and what is sneaking war. Feeling in Washington tonight is serious. The mood of the president is serious, as you will realize when he begins to speak. But the man who speaks tonight was chosen as the sovereign voice of the American people. He is your president and mine. Good night. Members of ENSA have entertained in the last few months officers and gallant men on the hood. You will feel as I feel about their last great gallant sacrifice. But, but the British Navy has in all its decades of history taken good care to avenge things of that kind. And that is why this morning at 11 o'clock the Bismarck was done. Oh,